My name is Gladys Raddick. I'm originally from Wet'suwet'en, uh, Witset, and uh, I'm an advocate for the missing and murdered women, uh, particularly on the Highway of Tears, but I also advocate for women and girls across the country. Most of my life I believed that my mother neglected me, and I found out after the fact, after my mother even passed away. What had happened was uh, they had hired a babysitter and it was the babysitter that took off and left us kids alone. And that's why they took us, that's why they stole us. They were, you know, accused my mother of neglecting and I was really hurt when I found out that it wasn't her that neglected us, it was the babysitter. That's how we ended up in foster care and that system really sucks. There was lots of uh, violence, lots of drinking. I went through, you know, my life with, uh, uh, of course, a lot of uh, actions like drinking, doing drugs, feeling sorry for myself, you know, not knowing how to deal with the fact that nobody would listen to me when I was an abused young girl. I, I've, been, I've been sober now for 13 years, but you know, I did start drinking at nine. I started smoking marijuana at nine. Started doing hard drugs when I was 12. You know, it didn't take much. But it was all to mask that pain that was in my heart and how worthless I felt. I decided uh, in 1999 to file a complaint with the uh, Vancouver RCMP and I charged my abuser and he got a slap on the wrist. I wasn't happy with that, but I'm a survivor. I'm not going to let them take me down. They, they've taken me down as far as they can and there's nowhere for me to go but up. I, I decided I was gonna go back to school from 96 to 99. So I was in Vancouver and I ended up going to the Native Education Center, which is where I think that I gained my voice in being proud of who I am as a First Nations woman because I never really thought about it because things were so bad for me all the time and how, how you know, being treated as a First Nations woman. So back in 99, I also uh, launched a, uh, a human rights tribunal where I was successful in proving systemic racism for the first time ever in Canada through tribunal. I was living in Vancouver. I was living across the street from Tinseltown Mall, it's called, and uh, was systemically followed by security. We lived in the building across the street from it, and you could tell it was a native housing building because it had a big mask carved on the front of the building, so everybody knew, right? So anybody that left our building was targeted. We were told to leave the mall. We were told to, that we couldn't go in there. We were asked what we were doing in the mall. We were followed. We were treated like common thieves for about six months while I lived in this, in this building. And so I went after their policy and basically we found out through the tribunal that it was their handwritten policy that First Nations people were not allowed in that mall. So what I did was I, I did change the policy and now in, <clears throat> in all of BC it is mandatory that they take a human rights module in their training package before they're handed their licenses. That's what I wanted. 
so that's really what gave me my voice was because uh, it took us four years to go through that human rights tribunal and that's when I realized you know how all of our people were being treated all the time. I started advocating for missing and murdered women when my niece, my beautiful niece, Tamara Lynn Chipman, uh, disappeared from Prince Rupert, B.C. in September 21st, 2005. The reason that it was heartbreaking for me is because back in 2002 when I was going to court here in Terrace, I moved back here for a year to do that. and. Uh, Tamara was a mainstay in my, in my house. She, came, she knew I was going to court. She was my moral support. Throughout my court proceedings, she knew what was going on and she would come over every day and uh, just to see how I was doing. And she'd come over and she'd come over regularly and eat with us. And, but she spent a lot of time with me. After Tamara went missing, it was, um, First of all, it broke my heart because uh, I knew that sh she had her son and she had her son after I left. I was actually looking forward to meeting him with her and uh, it didn't work out that way because she disappeared. And of course we got Tamara, my beautiful girl. But this is, uh, yeah, it is a timely process for me to uh, do the uh, pictures and laminating them. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, I have uh, a few printed out right now. And what I'll do is um, print them out and then I'll laminate them. And then I'll put them on my vehicle and after I'm done putting them on the vehicle, I usually um, go around and bless them all with my uh, smudge and, you know, just... And then I share their stories. That's the whole idea behind it, is to share their stories. This one's real special in my heart too. Anime, anime, Pictou Aquash, originally from Nova Scotia. And uh, I know her daughter, um, her daughter, I think, was a baby when her mother was killed. I remember the first van that we had, I had 131 pictures on there, all missing and unsolved murders. But it made such a profound impact because we started collecting names, not just from the Highway of Tears, but we also had the Picton Farm. We had Cody Legibokov. We're notorious in BC for serial killers. Through talking to the family members, that's the reason that I kept on putting the pictures on my van. I find that it's a, a good way to raise awareness and uh, also bring bring in more allies. You know, when people see the van, they're just flabbergasted. And so many times they, they ask me, what can I do to help? I heard about what Gladys was doing and I reached out to her. What I do for a living is I'm an archeologist. And when I was thinking about the missing and murdered women, just an idea popped into my head that, like, hey, someone could map 
all the known locations where women have gone missing, where women have been found, and, and map a corridor along the highway of places that are higher risk, higher potential places for people to go missing. So in closer proximity to the communities where they're hitchhiking to and from. And then in addition to that, we could map out and try to predict where potentially a perpetrator or a murderer might try to dump or hide a body and try to predict where those places might be. And then once we have everything mapped, we can look at um, commonalities and try to figure out uh, in those high-risk locations, could we possibly put up better lighting? Could we put in cameras? Could those places be regularly monitored or surveyed to check on them? I think it would just be a, a good way of keeping track of what's, what's happened along the highway and what could potentially happen into the future. When they had the symposium in uh, Prince George in, in March 2006, my cousin Florence had organized a walk. She was initially going to do it from uh, Prince Rupert to Terrace to raise awareness about Tamara and about the two girls from our community. And she wanted to walk. She wanted to do something to honour those women. When I heard about that, I wanted to go because now I was a brand new family member with a, with a missing niece and of course a couple other girls that I knew were my nieces and uh, of course I lost the use of my leg when I was uh, 18 years old. The day before my 18th birthday I was in a motorcycle accident and I lost the use of my leg and I chose to have it amputated four years later. But that didn't stop me from wanting to raise awareness. I remember the feeling that I got when I first started walking, and I realized that for every step that we took, you could feel actually the spirits of the women. And we knew by that time that there was quite a few that were actually missing out of Prince Rupert. It wasn't just Tamara. It was Alberta Williams, there was Mary Jane Hill, you know, and that's going back years. So that's when we realized how serious this was, and this is why it was called the Highway of Tears through Florence's relatives, where they realized that from Prince Rupert to Prince George, there was an awful lot of family members that were crying because their loved ones were either missing or unsolved murders. And the not knowing is, creates a lot of tears too. So we did make it up for the symposium. And it was, it, it was very well done because all of the recommendations that they made, there was 33 recommendations were done by the families. Unfortunately, um, not all of them, even to this date, have been uh, implemented. When Tamara went missing, I met a, a lady, Bernie Williams. She was active, quite active as an ad advocate. So in uh, 2007, I noticed that uh, nobody was really pushing with this Highway of Tears initiative. I thought about Florence's walks and I asked Bernie, I said, so you think it would be a good idea if we walked across the country for the missing and murdered women? And she jumped all over it. She said, well, let's not talk about it, let's do it. Through prayer, we did it. So that went on from Walk for Justice 2008 
2011. And then I took another little break because I wanted to see if anything was going to happen, see if there's going to be any positive movements or anything towards protect, protecting our women. And as it turns out, there was nothing. That's when I decided, you know, I'd, I'd heard from so many family members at that point in time, and that was in 2006, 2007 where uh, the families were saying, you know, if they're not going to do anything, well, then we need a national public inquiry. And we had no idea how much it was going to entail and how many issues pertaining to our women and girls that made it unsafe for us to be in this country. The National Inquiry, the recommendations that came out of there, there's 231 calls to justice. And uh, the thing that bugs me is that it's, it did stop at the government's door. We handed, we handed Justin Trudeau a copy of the recommendations. It took him two days to spit the word genocide out. The National Inquiry proved it, otherwise they wouldn't have put it in their, in their findings. See, when, the, when we had the inquiry, uh, when, when we delivered it, they were supposed to have a vast majority of those recommendations done in, within the first year, and then COVID hit. And then they used that for an excuse for them not to be able to move forward. But the, the recommendations, uh, I think they're trying really hard to keep them on the shelf. But we do have a lot of, uh, also through our walks, as we discovered that we've got tons of really good grassroots women that are working on the cause. And, uh, our women are definitely rising, and uh, the thing is, it's, it's still, right now, it's still a little bit early. And, and the biggest push, the biggest push actually we have right now is the uh, need for good, proper health, healing, and wellness facilities across the board because in order for any of us to move forward with a clear conscience, we need to be on our healing journey. Then uh, we can work on it. We can work on it together. The one thing I do ask for people to do is to uh, go to their MLAs, go to their uh, politicians and demand answers and demand them to uh, implement all of the recommendations that have been made. So when I moved back to Terrace here, uh, I put the word out with my friends and said that I wanted this totem pole and uh, Fortunate for us, Michael uh, Dangeli came forward and, and said that he would do it for us. So I relayed to him what my vision was to, to have a commemoration totem pole uh, to honour our missing and murdered women and the LGBTQ. And uh, when I explained to him uh, uh, the reason why, and it was for the families, uh, he jumped on it right away. I only told him once the story about what I wanted to see on the pole, and he got it. He uh, has put our story on this totem pole. Why sim gigat sagam hanak kubuksen? Got some milf at a teeth clean at a Mike Dangley Lagomsiwa. This beautiful fatan, this beautiful pole was commissioned uh, and, and uh, was asked to do this pole. 
as I listened to what Gladys and Arlene and, and the funders were wanting as far as the totem pole, and I sit least, uh, quickly sketched down something and then presented it to them uh, at that meeting. And so what they were asking for was the bottom figure, which is a, a, a nech, a killer whale. And the, where this totem pole is, is the uh, Gispatwada territory of the Kitsimkalem people. So this is killer whale territory. The uh, main little blowhole figure is uh, uh, the water bean, as water is life, and, and that connects us all together. On either side of the pectoral fin are little human beings, and they represent the people of Kitsimkalem outside of the killer whale clan. The figure, the both uh, the female and the male figure inside the tail, they're not upside down out of disrespect, it's just the way the, the sculpture went. But what they represent is the people that call the Lakhubum Simshan, the Simshan territory of Terrace, home, whether they be First Nations or not, or other nations. The next figures on the on the sides uh, are represent the children uh, who uh, went to residential school, who have had uh, to carry on with uh, the murdered and missing people, and they represent our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews. The main central figure in the very middle uh, represents the young girl uh, of the murdered and missing, uh, the young woman. On her and the female on the killer whale tail and as well uh, on these two, they have what are called kawits, which is the labrette, which is a sign of uh, a young noble or a noble woman. And so what I wanted to do is I asked my wife to actually paint these two uh, to imbue that power of, of femininity. The next figure is the uh, grandmother, the auntie, the mother, the sister. And she has a hand pounded cowitz out of uh, copper that I have pounded. Uh, on her button robe, the circle or the figure eight, uh, showing that we're in constant transformation so when we, our belief system is a really old belief that uh, we are uh, reincarnated and oftentimes we'll come uh, progressing into the next life, we'll come as a salmon first before we take a human or an animal form. And so what this represents is this transition of, of shifting into other beings. And on her robe, rather than using buttons, I inlaid mirrors. So what that does is it shows People are always watching. No matter, even if it's just a single person out here that somebody's always, that somebody's always witnessing, somebody's always uh, watching what you're doing. It's a really old belief. The very top figure on the, the matriarch's hat is a robin. And the robin uh, is Kitsimkalem. They're the people of the robin, the Gilakil. And so uh, I kind of uh, sandwiched in the uh, whose territory is and then and that it, I'm paying tribute but also honoring whose territory and land this is on. You know like the thing with our uh, with our totem poles and everything they last a lifetime and for several generations so people are going to know seven generations from now that this terrace is uh, the hub of the Highway of Tears, one of the major hubs for the Highway of Tears. That's why we always say that our women are lost but never forgotten. We're not going to let them forget. Whoa.